Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. My grandfather had cataract surgery back in the early 1980s. It seemed like a pretty big deal. He was in the hospital overnight. He came home with a huge bandage on his eye. And afterwards, he wore thick glasses with Coke bottle lenses because at that time, they didn't have the kind of lenses you could insert into a person's eye. Now today, cataract surgery has, has certainly come a long ways. It's seen uh, pretty much as an outpatient surgery with very quick recovery time. And in some ways, it's like LASIK surgery. It's a, it's a way for you to be able to see without glasses. Uh, when the leaders of the church that I served in Bulgaria asked me to help one of their members with her cataract surgery, well, it seemed like a pretty easy thing for me to to help with. I mean, it was only going to cost $35 uh, for the medical supplies. All the other uh, costs of the surgery would be carried by the government's national medical insurance. So, you know, why wouldn't I want to help a blind member see? What would Jesus do, right? (laughs) But I should have remembered my grandfather. I was uh, walking a pretty fine line there amongst the Roma people, the lowest socioeconomic people group in, in Europe. I was bringing the gospel of Jesus uh, to these people, but also financially assisting many of them in the congregation. And I'd help them out uh, buying some antibiotics here or some food, other small needs that people had. Obviously, for me as a missionary, preaching the gospel of Jesus was, was the most important thing that I was doing there. But what was going through the minds of my congregation? Now, the surgery on Baba Danka's first eye went well. And again, she came back from the hospital with a big bandage on her on her eye. And I thought, perhaps naively, that her family would, of course, be able and willing to help do the surgery on the second eye. But they refused to help their own flesh and blood. They reckoned that as the American, it was my responsibility. American expats living in developing countries have enormous financial power and endless opportunities to help others who are less fortunate. I mean, you see all kinds of beggars everywhere, Uh, missing limbs or having other kinds of physical ailments that are obvious to see. Uh, You see blind people uh, using their children as seeing eye dogs to help them navigate busy intersections and also in parking lots where all the expats go to do their shopping. All the time, people come up to me asking for a job. Uh, if I need a garden boy or a, or a house cleaner, and you know, salaries that they're asking for, fifty dollars a month meets the meets the need. That's pretty much the standard rate. And then, of course, those workers they come to you and and they ask you for advances on their salary and loans. Um, so that when payday comes, they receive about 20% of their salary. And, you know, they're going to be asking you for another advance 
the following week. And you get asked uh, for help with uh, sponsoring a child's education, starting from preschool, going all the way up through university. There's endless requests for, for help with medical emergencies and expenses. You know, the need is bottomless. Now, as an expat, I think there are two ways that you can react to these appeals. Uh, you can either, one, give because you feel guilty about it, or two, you can automatically say no to everyone. It's a defense mechanism. Now, why would you feel guilty? Well, obviously you have so much, right? And they have so little. And you know that a, a very small amount of money, at least from your perspective, can do so much good. Can you really tell the person, well, sorry, I can't afford it, and expect them to believe you? And the other response of saying no automatically, I mean, it's you fall into it so quickly because people see you, they, they know who you are, and you start to feel like you're being used or you're being presumed upon uh, by virtue of, you know, your race or your, um, your financial position. So it becomes kind of galling at times that random strangers ask you for help. And, and just saying, no, I don't have time, or even not paying attention to people, it is a way for you to cope with it, to deal with it. I wouldn't say that uh, either of those two ways of reacting are God-pleasing. There is a strong Christian tradition of helping out those who are in need. John the Baptist said, Let him who has two shirts give to him who has none. It seems to me, though, that the person who only has two shirts doesn't really have that much to begin with. Right? The, the command to help the poor is not just targeted at rich foreigners who seemingly have endless resources. Those who are in the best position to help someone are those who are the closest. In the New Testament book of 1 Timothy 5, the Apostle Paul wrote, If any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. And then there's another passage from 1 Timothy. It says that anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You know, who's supposed to help out the poor? Well, their relatives, according to these verses. Um, that would be the first place to go. You see, when I helped out uh, that, that church member with her eye operation, it led to her family members not helping their own flesh and blood. And you can call this when helping hurts, if you like, but it's a consequence of you as a foreigner stepping in quickly to resolve a problem when the better solution would be to let them see what they could do on their own. And that's tied into what, you know, sometimes is called a, a God complex or you want to call it a white savior, although really anybody of any color could be a savior. Um, it makes you feel good, right, to help somebody out. Uh, and it's a short-term fix, of course. You have to remember that because long-term, you really aren't making much of an impact on their overall situation. You're certainly not going to lift that person out of poverty. Um, you're not going to stop them from having any other kinds of problems. 
you're really only alleviating a, a problem for the for the moment. Uh, you may see yourself as a person that uh, others depend on for their well-being, right? Especially if you have uh, employees under you. But if you die, or if you have to leave the country, won't they survive? You know, money can only help with the needs of, of the body, and, and that's important, absolutely. Uh, but those, the money can help with needs in a way that is only temporary. Only God can save a person's immortal soul, and he does it, of course, with his word, not with gold or silver, right? The blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and God may use you as his messenger, and that's why it's good to, to demonstrate your Christian love, not just with words, but with actions. But God can also easily use someone else as his messenger too, can't he? Now, it's wrong uh, to be hard-hearted, to have a tough skin, to just in a knee-jerk way, say no to absolutely every request that comes your way. Um, certainly the rich are not exempt from helping the poor, as you remember from the parable of the rich man and the poor Lazarus. So, you know, it can be a useful strategy to set aside a certain amount of money each month that you're going to dedicate for assisting the poor. And it's, it's important to budget because you know, everyone's resources are limited. You simply cannot share every penny that you make or you will have nothing left. Um, it can also be useful to, to give uh, to only people with whom you have a relationship already. Uh, instead of just giving money to random strangers that you meet, you know, one of the things that really bothers me is when I see kids on the street begging. Those kids uh, shouldn't be there on the street. They should be in school. Their parents should be taking care of them. If anything, their parents should be begging and not the kids. But of course, people feel more inclined to give money to children than to adults, and that's why they're often sent out on those jobs. Um, it can be useful to set up boundaries uh, when you are giving money to people with whom you have a, a regular relationship. So, uh, for example, I will agree to help provide uh, for my worker's child's school fees, but I'm not going to uh, provide assistance with other kinds of requests. And, of course, it is useful and important to ask questions like, well, what is your family able to contribute, or what is your community doing to help you? But in spite of these strategies, sometimes there is no clear answer of what you need to do. So you make your decision to help or not to help. You know, we ask God daily for health, and wealth, and we receive blessings because of God's mercy, right? Because of His undeserved love towards us. Our need for forgiveness is bottomless. We receive God's assurance that we are His loved children because Christ sacrificed everything, His own life for us. He unselfishly put our needs first. So if we help others, let's do it in a God-pleasing way, not because of guilt or because we're trying to impress anyone or even earn points with God. We love because God loved us first. And my final encouragement is for any one of us who are in a position of being asked for help uh, to be filled with mercy and grace. You know, people who are in a tough situation, they are naturally going to look 
to others first. I mean, it's worth a shot, right? Why not try and ask for help? But you uh, should never assume that these people have nowhere else to turn. Now, dependency is a bad thing. We all realize that. But in many times, you are fighting a culture that has been shaped by decades and maybe centuries of mistreatment and injustice and learned bad behaviors and attitudes. Don't expect someone to understand your, you, if you say, you know, it's not in your long-term interests for me to help you today. And finally, remember, but by the grace of God, you and I would be in that person's shoes. The next time on Home Ties, people who are in the public eye need to watch themselves carefully uh, because others are watching them too. A lifetime of faithful service is negated by one scandal. And that's why you have spin doctors and damage control and alternative facts, people trying to control the narrative. On the stories that we tell from the mission field, we try to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. But we must remember that whomever we put up on a pedestal has feet of clay. We'll see you next time.